You are listening to Reinvented. I'm your host, Jen Eckhart. Okay, so a lot of my fans and listeners are going to freak out a little over today's guest because it seems the world has gotten mesmerized watching this hit Netflix series called Love is Blind. Now, for those who don't watch the reality show, allow me to give you a brief overview. And I'm just going to say it. I'm just going to let it rip. The show's concept is batshit crazy. I said what I said, it's insane. It makes no sense to me, but I can't look away. I can't get enough. And apparently neither can the rest of the world. The show is a social experiment where single men and women look for love and get engaged. But, 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 here's the kicker. They get engaged before ever meeting in person. That's right, you heard that right. Singles try to find a match and fall in love in what's called the pods, where a wall separates the potential couples without ever seeing each other face to face as emotional connection attempts to conquer physical attraction. Now, Nick Lachey, who some might argue is a god among men, along with his wife, Vanessa, hosts this social experiment that has quickly become one of the most popular, most viewed shows ever in Netflix history. And today, Reinvented has the distinct honor of featuring one of the stars from its latest season, season four of Love is Blind, Kwame Pia. Welcome to Reinvented, my friend. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jen. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. You know, we're going from the pods to the pod, my podcast. Did I say that right? I'm just, I want to be a part of the pod squad so bad. So I'm just, I, I, I don't know. Did I submit say that correctly? Application. Yeah, submit an application. I'll, I'll send it in. We'll see how it goes. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Thanks. All right. I can audition. So, all right. First things first, Kwame. And I have to tell my view. And I, by the way, Kwa, I didn't tell Kwame any of like, really, we didn't go over a lot of what we were going to discuss on this interview. So he's just kind of being thrown in here. But I, I think it's great. I have to tell my viewers and listeners how you and me even came to know each other, because this story, I think, deserves to be shared with the world. I shared during the last episode of my show that I'm currently living in the Sunshine State here in Florida. Now, being a Florida resident, Kwame, I take my pool floats very seriously. Okay. Like routine pool maintenance and freshly blown up floats are now like a hardcore hobby of mine. Now I needed, I needed a name for my beloved pool swan. And I don't know why, but I settled on the name Kwame and even (laughs) went so far as to post a photo of the float. And then I tagged the actual Kwame from love is blind as my swan. Now keep in mind, Kwame and I didn't know each other. We've never met. I'm just a fan of his. I'm a fan of the show. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you might be wondering, Jen, why did you tag Kwame as your swan? Well, my friends, this strategic move was clearly successful at getting Kwame's attention because after I posted the photo, he commented, LOL, um, wait, why am I a swan? So... (laughs) That's our little story. Now, given your fame and notoriety, Kwame, I would imagine a number of people name their pool floats after you, or is this a first for you? Uh, I think in terms of pool floats, I'm going to say it's a first. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Who am I kidding? I I actually name, I mean, do you think it's weird that I've named every pool float after the cast of season four of Love is Blind and Nick Lachey? You know what? Um, I'm not going to say it's weird. I'm going to say you do your thing. And if if it makes you feel good, we're okay with it. I mean, who am I kidding? I name everything in my life after Nick Lachey because (laughs) I think everyone has an... I'm just going to say this blanketly. I think everyone has an unhealthy obsession with the guy. And I'll I'll, I'll throw myself into that ring as well. Um, I name everything after Nick Lachey. (laughs) So moral of the story, folks, tag celebrities as your pool floats. Because you never know what friendship will transpire as a result. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Now that we've gotten this one out of the way, Kwame thinks I'm insane, by the way. Kwame, we bring people on this show who have reinvented themselves. To me, and I think to a lot of other, a lot of your fans out there, you are living proof of what it means to reinvent oneself. And I have to be honest, you, a lot of people stood out to me on the show, but you especially stood out for a number of reasons. 
And I'm going to get into Love is Blind because I know that that's probably why a lot of people are tuning into this show right now. But you have a moving yet interesting backstory that a lot of people don't know about. You're originally from Ghana. You've spoken about your struggles with coming to the United States and the bias you felt. Immigration is a hot topic these days, regardless of your political affiliation. To me, Kwame, you represent the American dream. And I, and I, I say that wholeheartedly. Can you talk to me a little bit about your background originally and why you and your family decided to come to the United States? Yeah, for sure. Um, which, by the way, I appreciate that that intro. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know. Sorry, a little bit of a hard hard left from uh, pool floats to now. Hey, tell me why you came to the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great segue. Um, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, born in Ghana, came here at the age of eight, and um, it was kind of an interesting story. When when you're back home, and and for a lot of uh, a lot of people in you know, countries trying to basically, you know, come up the ladder of society. Uh, it's, it is a big thing, like the American dream, right? And so if you live in what is considered a third world country, the goal is like, how can I go to America, become really rich, and then send my family money, right? Yeah. That really yeah. is like, it is kind of our, you know, the, the story. And that's kind of what we go through. And so from the minute I was born, that was the process that my parents were trying to achieve. And back home, it is, I wouldn't say rare, but it is unlikely to get the opportunity to do so um, unless a lot of things line line up, uh, especially back in the day. I mean, I was born in 1990, so around that time, it was a bit tougher. So oh my gosh, we we're the same age. Sorry, I just got excited about that. <laughs> we learned something about every Yay, day. Yay, 90s oh. kids. 90s kids, love 90s it. Kids. Uh, and so we we called it a lottery system, even because it was kind of like that far fetched. Wow. Right. So you have to have a lot of things line up. You have to have a certain amount of money. You have to have someone here who can make sure that if things don't go well, you can lean on them. So there are a lot of things that line up in order to get you a visa to come to right. the States. Right when I was born, my dad was, you know, already working on that. And then, you know, prior to me having any real like cognizance as a as a child, my mom was already gone. And so that was all before I think I was a year old. Wow. Uh, and they, yeah, they were working on that. And, you know, from from my inception and uh, once I turned eight, uh, all I know is we were getting on a plane. We were wearing some lanyards that said, uh, hey, we're kids traveling alone because it was me, my brother and my sister. Wow. Yeah, we landed at JFK Airport and then boom, that, that was the first time I really met my parents. And uh, yeah, that's <laughs> that's. A and story. then fast forward and you're on Love is Blind. Amazing. Fast, I'm on Love is Blind. <laughs> <laughs> no, a lot, obviously a lot happened between then and now, but I just, I get chills hearing that because I, I, I really do think it's amazing. And I think the sky's the limit for you. And I do think I see a, an insanely bright future ahead for you. You know, in 2015, you graduated from Goldie Beacom College. Did I say that correct? Goldie Beacom, Goldie Beacom College. Gold, I know. Gold, that's a mouthful, by the way. It is. Gold, it Goldie, is. Goldie Beacom College in Wilmington, <laughs> Delaware. Yeah. You got a Bachelor of Business uh, Administration degree. You yeah. started college in 2008, but took a semester off in 2010 because you couldn't afford it and waited tables instead. I have a saying on the show, Kwame, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but you know, I always say you're not allowed on the show unless you've known what it's like to struggle, unless you've known defeat, unless you've fallen down, made an ass of yourself, had to get back up, dust yourself off. Tell me, you know, I'm going to, I want to peel back the Kwame layers here. Tell me a little bit about that time when you were a waiter before Love is Blind, before Netflix, before the fame and the notoriety. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I would say I appreciate that sentiment a lot. Uh, I really do have a, a special place in my heart for people who kind of go through a struggle, um, obviously having to go through it myself. And I think... <clears throat> One thing that was ingrained in me through my life was like, if something isn't there for you, you have to find a way to get to it, you know? And so it was unfortunate that financially, you know, my family wasn't in, in the right place to help me just kind of go through and streamline through college. And so taking that time off, I told myself, like, no matter what I'm going to do, no matter what I can do, um, no, no matter what I'm capable of, I'm just going to keep pushing. And wow. so... So yeah, I, I got a really, really fortunate opportunity at a at a restaurant, a Ruby Tuesdays. I don't know if you ever eaten at one of those. <laughs> Great old, good old American establishment, Ruby Tuesdays, right up there with oh. Chili's. Yeah, awesome. Right up, 
Yep. Um, Outback, all those. Um, but, Bloom and Onion. Love yep. it. Love it. Okay. Yeah. How many and, years were you, did you wait tables for? So I think three or maybe four. Um, wow. Yeah, I was, I was at it for a little bit. So even when I went back into school, I was still waiting tables. Uh, but during that time, it was part-time school, part-time waiting tables. And then I actually picked up a part-time gig at Apple as well. Um, so, yeah, I so I was, I was at the Apple store uh, at Christiana Mall in Delaware. And so I was doing that. So I think I started, I think, in 2011. Okay. But, yeah, when you start off, obviously, very, very light schedule. And so I was getting maybe 15 hours a week. Right. You know? So I was doing that uh, early on in the mornings, school in the middle of the day, and then waiting tables at night. And so, yeah, that was- I love was- to hear it. I love, I mean, the the resiliency and your determination to get an education, to- to climb the ladder at all costs, no matter what it took, I think is what sets you apart. And I, I just think that that's really special. But another thing is that you are uh, were an NCAA student athlete and played as a Ford on the men's soccer team at your school. Yeah. In 2011, you came back to school and took enough credits to maintain a partial soccer scholarship. This was while, m- mind you, this was while waiting tables for, you know, also while work juggling, working for Apple, I think like four days a week. Week, I, I have to say, I, mad respect for you, Kwame. I mean, we've had many guests on this show who've literally come from nothing and have had to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. I don't think there's any other way to go through life, quite frankly. I think resilience is definitely a big word that does come up. Uh, but I also think seizing opportunity. I think opportunity and I think the word luck is really just a combination of like preparation meeting yes. opportunity. And so, uh, you know, I was really, really fortunate to meet the right people along the way. And as we were going together, I was learning new things and I was constantly learning to push myself that further step. My family did a lot to get me to the point that I am, you know, and and through the things that I was going through. I remember my (laughs) when I I didn't have enough money to go to school or was kind of in that interim portion. My mom drove up to school to sit there with our, our dean of students and figure out any way that we, she can make it happen, right? So what that kind of settled in on me was that I have these people who really, really are fighting to help me make it, you know? And so I don't want to let them down and not in a bad way of like, they're going to be so disappointed, but I want to I want to put a smile on their face when I succeed, you know? And I so that. that was really important to me to just, just keep pushing. And I I think we, you know, my wife and I talk about this occasionally nowadays is just like, I do feel in my heart that if I fail, I don't have anyone coming to rescue me. Right. I think that's something that people would just like have to keep in mind, prioritize and like focus on because yeah, you don't want to think about failure as an option, but ultimately the point of considering failure is to realize that the alternative is success, right? And so I'm focusing on my success and staying away from my failure. And so I just got to keep pushing till I get there. What a healthy attitude. Thank you for sharing that. That was like a total mic drop moment. You were also a former professional soccer player. What? When I watched Love is Blind season four, I was like, I had to like rewind and do a double take. I was like, whoa, whoa, what? You were a serious athlete. Kwame, playing in the USA and abroad. You played on American soccer teams, the Philadelphia Fury and the Delaware Stars. You left the country to play pro soccer in Sweden, which is just so badass. You suffered a career ending injury in 2018. And I I, I get chills bringing that up and I'm sorry to bring it up, but you know, like I said, we don't invite people on the show unless you've known struggle and you've known defeat. And you know, while I'm so sorry to hear about this injury, Kwame, I've I've featured a lot of star athletes actually on this show, Brett Favre recently being one of them, who suffered, I mean, at the height of his football career was suffering from a crippling painkiller addiction that no one even knew about. And one thing I've noticed that all the athletes that I've had on have in common is that they have this sort of career defining moment, whether they've failed or lost or didn't quite make the Olympic cut, you know, a moment that sent them on a path they never envisioned for themselves at the time, but in looking back and connecting the dots realized it all 
happened for a reason. It all happened for a greater purpose. Where do you fall in line with that sentiment? Yeah, that that <laughs> that definitely hits home for sure. I think I had a very, very, very big defining moment that actually took me out of the game that, you know, I'm, I'm glad that it did. And, you know, between you and I, I feel like I'm actually still at a point where I could maybe go play one or two more seasons nowadays. But uh, <laughs> let's go get the scouts. We got to get the yeah. got to get the scouts <laughs> listening to reinvented. I know. Right. When I finished uh, college, I wasn't the most phenomenal soccer player. I was a great athlete. Um, what people don't know about my soccer career is that I started playing soccer when I was 17. And so I was missing a lot of the foundation that a lot of players had. So any team that I played for, I was probably the worst technical player. Um, however, I was just freakishly athletic. So I was really blessed with that. Um, but when I finished college, I thought to myself, you know what? Hey, I'll probably put this aside and I'll focus on my career. My goal was to finish with my master's degree and then go to Cupertino and start working for Apple. In that process, I got a, an email from my college coach and it said, hey, there's a new league that's starting. Uh, they just want to have some players come try out, see what the feel of, you know, the area is like in terms of like talent and things like that. Right. And so it was a new league that was starting up, the American Soccer League. And the first team that they were initiating in was the Philadelphia Fury. And so I went to the tryout. They had a couple hundred people there and they were looking for a few people to start. Like when we had to talk with the manager, the owner, founder, like he was everything. Um, he was looking for six players. And so I went to this tryout. Okay. To myself, like, there's no way I'm going to make this team. I'm and just, how old are you at this time? How old are you? I think I was 24. Okay. Okay. Yeah. This um, is nail biting. Yeah. Right. And so I go in thinking I'm not going to make this team. We go have our little post conversation. And he says, hey, if I, if we really liked you, uh, we'll pull you aside or we'll call you or whatever. And so I'm I'm walking out of the facility and he just comes up to me and taps me on the shoulder. And he says, hey, Kwame, I just wanted to let you know after these three days, I just want to uh, impart on you that I do believe that you'd be a great fit for us. Um, so I'd love to sign you. And I'm like, no way. <laughs> wow. That's like that's like something out of the movies. That's only something that happens in the movies. You know wow. Yeah. So it was it was pretty it was kind of shocking. Um, and so when it first happened, I thought to myself, okay, wow, like I'm a pro soccer player now. I can quit my job and, and focus on this, blah, 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 blah. But in all actuality, just like in anything else, there's levels to everything. Right. So the PSL wasn't exactly the, the league or the team that was going to help me do that. Right. right. But it was, but it was a, a nice start. It was a start. Yeah. You know, my first professional contract, I was getting paid to play soccer, getting paid to train. And so that, that mattered at that time. Right. But more important than the money I was making, it was the inspiration to believe that I was better than I thought I would. Wow. Right. And that was really important. Sometimes we just need that. Yeah. So, yeah. So I started training with the team. Once again, in, you know, in, in practice, in truth, the worst player on the field by far. Oh, uh, come on. I, I was, but I just, I had the desire to just keep pushing and I was running. I was working hard. I bet you were the fastest though, because I saw you I run <laughs> on after the altar. And let me tell you, you are fast, my friend. So <laughs> I will say that's one thing I always luck out on is, uh, I'm, I'm pretty quick. Uh, so got the fortune of playing with that team for, I think two years. Philadelphia um, Fury. Okay. Working along with them, trying to get better and improving throughout the time. Went from them to the Delaware Stars, all still in that same league. So not still something that was going to change my life, but something that kept me going. Right. Okay. Right. And then the funniest story about how I ended up going to Europe was I went to a tryout in Virginia that was for like European clubs. And I did. You just randomly went to a tryout. So I, I got a, another little notification as I was okay. playing for the ASL. So I was in practice. I was, you know, kind of improving. And I went to this tryout, didn't make any of the teams. However, I just like, in a friendly conversation, I was talking to a coach from Iceland and he said, hey, if you're ever in town, um, you know, come train with us. Right. So I, I'm on my way to Iceland for vacation. Um, you're I, like, I just happen to be in Iceland, yeah, ironically. <laughs> um, so I go, I train with them. 
and they're a really low level division team. So they probably give me less than my team in, in the USA is, but I have kind of an incredible training session wow. and conveniently. And this so, is in Iceland. This is in Iceland. Iceland? Yeah, this is in Reykjavik, Iceland. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Could, could be worse places to train, by the way. <laughs> I will say it was winter time, so it was pretty dark. Oh, oh, actually, yeah, I take that back. I retract I retract my statement. <laughs> but conveniently, the person who is running around the track is a first division Iceland coach. He comes up to me after the training session. Like he asked the coach to speak to me. He's like, Who are you and what are you doing here? <laughs> Right. And I'm like, I love this. I love this. You're like, I have no idea. I was just on vacation. (laughs) So that, that worked out to me. Like it it was just serendipity. Um, He said, Hey, come train with us. And we have a game on Saturday. You can play with us. And I said, yeah, I'm leaving in a few days, but I'll, I'll give it a try. And so I went to my first training session with them. Did horrible by the way, because (laughs) they were all incredible. Like they were very talented. Okay. Um, However, I am someone who kind of I turn on when when the game is on more You're so compa- than when- oh oh we we all saw it play out on on uh, after the altar trust me I, but yeah. I love the competitiveness I love it I love that spirit um, so I did terrible in the training session but when I went to the game that we played uh, we played against a uh, team uh, we had a little scrimmage he said hey I'll start you and then I'll remove you after the first forty five minutes you know go have your fun and then we'll call it a day right. And then I scored a hat trick in the first three, uh, 45 minutes. Unbelievable. So. <laughs> See, you perform, you're like me. You perform and do well when the pressure's on. You need the eyeballs. You need the crowd. You need, you need all that energy. I love it. Yep. yep. And so it worked out. Um, that just struck conversation with him and then with like his connections and his network. And so from there, <clears throat> it propelled me to go on to Latvia. Um wow. Yeah, I I, uh, went on to do things in um, Greece, uh, checked out Belgium for a short while, um, and then eventually ended up in Sweden. This was the heartbreaking part, was that after all the work that I put in to get to this point, after all the tryouts and working and training with these teams, um, where I was training and practicing with pro-level teams, like the top tiers, the the Division Ones and the the Premier Leagues, when I got to uh, Sweden... The word was and the conversation with the coach was, hey, we don't necessarily have like space for you on our first team. Okay. But what you can do is we can play you here on, you know, kind of like one of our smaller club teams. Right. Train with them. This is the coach. He's going to get you aligned. We're going to get the right things going. Right. <clears throat> um, so I played with that team first half of the season, top scorer in that league, top points getter in that league. It's looking great. The coaches are coming to watch. Recruits are coming to watch. Things are about to blast. I like end up in the Swedish news- newspaper. Like, who is this guy who just came? Yeah. Electric, blah blah blah. Right, right. Um, we have our season break. I go home and I come back. Second half of the season, first game, which is like basically my transition period because I'm about to phase out of this team into the first team. Right, right. First game back, someone goes after my ankle. Man. Yeah, it's it was terrible, and it started out as just a little fra- a little sprain, like a hairline and, fracture. Yeah, tiny okay. tiny little thing. Okay. And my my dumb self, being as competitive as I am at that continued, time, continued to play on your ankle. I I need to play, and that's why that's why I messed up. And, and in retrospect, that's one thing you know you don't really have regrets, but that's one thing I would have changed just for that moment. But regardless, life played out the way that it was supposed to. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, yeah, I ended up turning it into a significantly worse fracture, um, not being able to play um, and really have like a tryout session and and actually phase into the first team. Came back to to Maryland, to my sister Barbara's house. um, Love Barbara. Love her, by the way. Everybody loves Barbara. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So I came back to rehab and get myself ready. I started working a little sales development gig just to kind of like pass the time as I was doing this to to get ready for the next season. Right. And uh, the next season is when COVID happened. 
Yeah. yeah, which wasn't, gosh, which like it feels kind of still like yesterday, maybe because it was just that <laughs> traumatic for everyone. But 2020 yeah. really does feel like it was yesterday. So, exactly. yeah, and so, um, uh, that there goes all the dreams. It's like now I didn't have any connections. I didn't have any way to get over to any other borders or any country. And so everything well, was travel closed. was shut down. But that wasn't your fault. Travel was shut was, down. Yeah. It was a global pandemic. What are you going to do? Exactly. What are you going to do? Yep. But, wow. but yeah, but at least that's kind of how I just told myself, you know what? It just might be time. Might might be time to hang up the boots. And so, yeah, I just kept going with my sales development career and, you know, it panned out well. Well, so my my follow-up, and by the way, thank you for sharing that story. I had no, this, it doesn't say this online anywhere. So like, I feel like people are really going to hear this and say, wow, like that's, that, that really is an incredible story. Just showing your sheer determination and everything you went through to get to that pivotal life-changing moment. My follow-up to this was going to be, was it difficult giving up your pro-level soccer dream? But it sounds like, I mean, here's the good news, Kwame you're, you're not old, you're still young. And I mean, you could, is this a dream that you're going to pursue? I mean, is it something you're actively looking into? I mean, I, I, I would hate to see you give this up because you're obviously such a phenomenal athlete and soccer is a huge passion of yours. What do you think the future holds for you? You know, when it comes to soccer, I can't guarantee that I'm ever going to be able to really step back to the level that I was. Um, but I, I am trying, right. And, uh, it's really convenient that, I found a team in Seattle that's <laughs> really, really good. There's a start. Um, club club team? Club team. Okay. And so uh, we're, we play at an amateur level, but at the highest level amateur here, which is great because it qualifies us for a tournament called the U.S. Open Cup. There you go. All right. Yeah. Right. And it, the U.S. Open Cup is a national tournament with all the best teams in the state. So it'll be all the way from our level to MLS. Right. And so you will all be like, it'll be like nice intermingling tournaments. And so this is a great way to prove to myself that you still got it. You still still got got the juice. So if I can do well in this tournament over the next, our first game is October 1st. If I can do well in this tournament, um, I think I'm going to give myself a final push. Well, here's the good news. We know you're going to do well because when the cameras are on and when the crowd's (laughs) cheering, that's obviously when the pressure's on, that's when you succeed. Yeah, so. that's the goal, right? <laughs> I love it. And then we need to somehow try to figure out if we can also like leverage the love is blind notoriety to, you know, like who knows star power. Sometimes you can maybe oh. like flex your way. I don't know if pro sports works that way. I have, <laughs> I have no idea. I just, I love your story and I think you're such a phenomenal athlete and I love, I love that you haven't given up on this dream. So keep pursuing it for all of us, please. Thank you. I hope it works out. <laughs> Kwame, do you, I have to, I have to ask you, do you watch Ted Lasso? Yes. Oh my oh, goodness. Oh yeah. my. Okay. So I have to add like million dollar question. Who's your favorite character on, on Ted Lasso? Without a doubt. Easiest one, Danny Rojas. Oh my God. I knew you were going to say that. I was going to say it at the same time. I was going to say on the count of three, let's both say our favorites. Uh, Dan- <laughs> Danny Rojas, yes. football is life. Do you, uh, do you like walk around saying that football, football is oh, life? Oh my goodness. Yeah, so many times. Anytime that I'm with my, um, anytime I'm with my soccer friends, so I'm kicking a ball in there. I'm saying something about that. Does Ch- now, my- does Chelsea watch Ted Lasso too, or did you like recruit her? Or <laughs> I've tried. I've tried. No, um, she doesn't. I know. Like- Chelsea doesn't like Ted Lasso. I wouldn't say she didn't like Ted Lasso. I just this think is grounds that. for divorce. I'm kidding, <laughs> but that's weird. Everyone I know loves Ted Lasso. I know. I just think we just need to try it again because we might have just watched it at a time where we were really like mentally busy. Because mm. I think Love Is Blind was going on as well, and I was like, "Hey, mm. instead of watching this, let's watch Ted Lasso." Yeah. Okay. Let's All right. Really I'm gonna it. have to. I'm gonna have to have a little off the record chat with Chelsea after this wraps <laughs> up. You used to be the head of community development for a business platform called the Common Room. Yes. You recently took a step back, and you told me that you run your own photography and videography side hustle, which I think is so great. Tell me what inspired your passion for photography. Yeah, I will say so. I haven't done it as much recently as I would like to, but it definitely is one of those side passions that like I can get up at any point in time and do. I have a website still. Um, I saw, I saw it. I checked it out. <laughs> You're very talented. You're very thank good. You. Thank you very much. Um, so when I was traveling uh, for soccer and I was going through all these amazing places, especially in Europe, I kept thinking to myself, like, what do I have to show for this? You know? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And so I thought to myself, like, 
I need to find a way to just at least start taking some pictures just so I can remind myself how beautiful these places were. Wow. And yeah. that took me on this journey of like going uh, to YouTube and finding out like, hey, how do I take the right pictures and do this and do that? And next thing I know, I'm like, hey, maybe I should get the right camera because it'll do, you know, take these pictures in this way. And so when I started that, it started just like a passion project and something fun for me. Right. And then I started just putting it on my Instagram page. And, and people then loved it. People loved it. And one day when I was <clears throat> back home, uh, kind of for, for a brief period of time, as I was waiting to go to back to Europe, one of my friends just said, hey, would you mind, like, we don't have a big budget for our wedding. Um, would you mind just, like, taking our wedding photos? And I was like, yeah, sure. Why not? And yeah, right. Sure. I'll just photograph the most important day of your life. Yeah, I love it. But that's so great. And you did it. Yeah. And I did it. And it turned out pretty, pretty darn good. And then wow. from there, yeah, I just started having people like reach out to me and say, hey, this person said you did their wedding and that. And so next thing you know, I'm starting to like, I was doing weddings. And so You're an entrepreneur spirit and you have a talent and that's, that's awesome. How can people in the Seattle area hire Kwame from Love is Blind to photograph <laughs> their wedding? Uh, you know what? They can um, they can hit me up on Instagram. Uh, I'll, I'll respond. But I also do I have a website, agentquam.com. You do realize, though, that when people hire you, they're going to want like you in a lot of their photos, <laughs> though, right? Just, just so you know, you got to know yeah. what you're getting yourself into here with this photography <laughs> side hustle. Yeah, I know. Crazy. Well, that's awesome. You know, fast forward to today, you are now married to Chelsea Griffin from the show Love is Blind. And uh, by the way, having never met in person before being engaged, crazy, yeah. I know, crazy, but congrats to you both. How, tell me, Kwame, how does someone begin the process of getting on Love is Blind? I think we've all said, you know, screw this. Let's just go on The Bachelor. Let's go on Love is Blind. This dating scene can't possibly get any worse. Tell the world, how does one get on the show and become Kwame? And not the pool, <laughs> not the pool swan. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is a funny thing that ended up on the internet for a little bit and people really bashed me for it. But um, the way that I ended up on Love is Blind was because when I first got back to the States <clears throat> in, I think, 2018 it was, or 2019, um, someone tried to recruit me for, uh, married at first sight. Mm, I think yeah. I remember reading that. Yeah. And so, um, when they reached out to me, like I remember the conversation was so funny. Hey, um, like I, I don't, you don't know me, but I got your number from this person. And I just wanted to ask you, like, would you think that you're ready to get married? And I'm like, Whoa, <laughs> I'm like, uh, I don't think so. Uh, and then I just kind of moved on. But about a month later, I was just having a fun chat with my sister, with Barbara, and, and uh, she was like, you know what? Why not? Why not try it? Right now, there's no real direction in life, and it's something that at least points you in a direction. Right. And so admittedly, at that point in time, I'm not sure if I was exactly ready to get married, but I was ready to kind of just take the next step in my journey, right? Because what you get to do through those, like through any dating experiment or dating show is do a lot of self-realization and, and kind of oh, like- yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. And like watch shit. it out, watch it play out in, on the world stage, you know, in exactly. real time. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's how it all first started. But I went to, you know, I, I, you know, took a step forward. We went through like, I think one or two days of filming or whatever. And, and ultimately kind of just like both parties knew that like, I just wasn't really there, you know, yeah. and so it worked out perfectly. So Married I that at first sight, you don't say, you don't say. <laughs> yeah. Right. What so is I'm, it with you, Kwame? I, you like meeting girls behind walls without seeing them. You got married <laughs> at first sight. Like, don't, don't you like to get to like physically see a person first? I'm yeah, kidding. But crazy. that, that's funny. I know. I think yeah. I, and I do remember you receiving some heat about that, but were you actually on married at first sight or? Oh, I wasn't. I wasn't okay. at all. Yeah, I was like, I was on the first day, day of filming, which was like anybody who was anybody who right. was not like partially cast, but not people who were actually on the show. So, yeah, I got a lot of heat for that. People saying that, hey, I just wanted to be on a reality You're show. You're just but doing I this for the clout, for the fame, yeah. <laughs> so that girls can name their pool swans after you. I get it. I get it. Yeah, it's fair. That's, that's that's my life goal. So, um, get, <laughs> so can you give us a day in the life of Kwame on Love is Blind? Like, I've always been curious. And look, I, I'm a T, I've been a national TV journalist now for 
like, gosh, over a decade. But, you know, I left my prior previous employer. I launched my own podcast show. But, you know, reality TV is something that's always been fascinating to me. And I'm curious, like, do you get up at 6 a.m.? Do you work out? Do you eat breakfast and then sit in the pods for hours and hours and hours? Like, can you just like walk us through a typical day in the life of Love is Blind and Kwame on the show? Yeah, no, it's, it's pretty it's pretty normal. I know that it's uh, I think the show and the studios received a lot of heat, um, which in all act- like in all honesty, <clears throat> it is a rigorous process. Right. It's not easy, um, mm-hmm. but it's definitely not. Um, it, it's not like a life or death situation to any degree. <laughs> right. It's you do wake up like it, it was actually I, I had a great time there because during that time. You get to really focus on yourself, the people around you, and obviously the people on the other side of this wall. And I made crazy great connections. Marshall's one of my best friends now. Uh, Brett is one of my best friends now. Zach is one of my best yeah. friends now. Yeah. You know, so a day in the life is we wake up, we have breakfast together, you know, and then we get on set and, um, you know, obviously we get mic'd up and things. And then, uh, you know, during that, the, the like process of the day, it's, If you have dates, you're in your pods and you're having your conversations, you're talking. If you don't have dates, you're out in the lobby and there's access to food. You can cook that food. You can order some food. (laughs) Like, wow. They set you up in a real living situation. Wow. Yeah, Yeah, it was convenient. And um, I mean, obviously, like there's there's limits to it um, to make sure that you stay kind of focused on the experiment. But ultimately, it was not anything over the top. I would come in hang out in the lobby a lot with the guys, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, Did you, did you, did you hang out with Nick Lachey? Everyone wants to know. (laughs) I think I only had a a couple of brief conversations with Nick. Nick's a cool guy. Brief, Um, brief conversation. What do you mean? You're not like besties. You don't like go to games on the weekends with each other. You don't come on Kwame. Just just lie. Really? You're not besties with Nick Lachey. How does one do love is blind and not be besties with Nick? How does that work? He's actually calling me right now. (laughs) Oh, answer it. Answer it. (laughs) Ask if he can come on the reinvented podcast, by the way. Um, But like, so I guess I had this image in my mind of like, like endless drinking and endless partying and like, you know, cause I, I've heard stories that, you know, the set on the bachelor or the bachelorette can be, is very different in contrast when compared to love is blind. I guess you guys are a little more like uh, PG. No, we're not PG. We have a lot of fun. Uh, okay. All right. was, yeah. We had a great time back there. There's a little bit of our rated fun Sounds like that's happening behind. The I scenes. mean, I wouldn't call it R-rated, but uh, we'll, call, we'll we'll like put it right in the middle, right? We're we're having a good time. Like the guys are, well, we we were a rowdy bunch. Like yeah. we had a really good time. We made sure that everyone was entertained, felt at home. We got really, really, really tight, you know. Yeah. And so yeah, it was all in the fun of just like getting to know each other more. Now, you received some criticism in the press for being too honest during Love is Blind season four. Is that even possible? Or do you think your honesty about the whole Chelsea and Micah dynamic ended up being the reason why you and Chelsea ultimately seemed to like defy the odds and were a successful couple in the end, both on the show and in real life? Yeah, I think honesty is a big part of it. You you can get a lot of hate, right? Yeah. So I think, especially when it comes to the way that things are presented in reality TV, yeah, right. Because you're saying something, and it not to say it's always going to be misconstrued, but if a message is too direct, it can come off as offensive or harsh or harm harmful or whatever the case may be. And I feel like I was just somebody who was very honest about my feelings because I wanted to go through all those feelings there, yeah, not afterwards, right? right? I get I that. Saying, That's fair. Yeah, I wanted to say what was on my mind, what was what I was actually thinking about. And I wanted everybody to know this is what I'm processing. These right. are the things that I'm having. And these are the things that are making me want to move forward. Like this is an actual decision people are going through. I feel like sometimes it's difficult for people to separate us as a person or as a character. Right. Right. You're just like, oh, this character on my TV is like making this decision and I should make that for them. Like, and this is what I think they should do. And since they're yeah. not, doing it, that's a terrible idea. But in Fair. actuality, I had a very, I had, as you can see, I'd been through a lot to get my life to where it was. Right. And in order to make 
a drastic change in it within the snap with the snap of a finger. It's not that easy. And obviously I got to know my partner very, very well and we're married and we're happy and life is amazing. But in order to make a decision that's that life changing, when you've spent 31, 32 years to curate your life into something that makes you happy, right. to change that within the course of 30 something days, it's overwhelming. Yeah. The pressure's on. I get it's it. Hot, you know? And so I just, I took the feelings that were inside and I let them outside as opposed to clouding or, or, <clears throat> uh, or in any way kind of hiding or masking them. And I think that that might've been where I, I won't say that's where I went wrong because ultimately it got me to where I am now. Look, right? you're human. Yeah, I get it. And so, yeah, I think it was important for me to relay the message of what was going on through my mind, because I think sometimes people see us as characters and they yes. don't see the process that we're going through in our life. Right. To the questions as if they were going through the scenario. Right? That's and why it, people have to tune into reinvented to see the real Kwame, the real, <laughs> the real person. Yeah. You know, I was having a conversation with a close friend of mine the other day who shared that his partner was everything he didn't envision ending up with. And on paper, like, it makes no sense, makes no sense, but it just works. And they're happy and they're in love and they're getting married soon. I mean, is that similar to how you initially felt about Chelsea? I think we have um, some differences for sure, but I also think we have a lot of similarities that feed to our chemistry. You know, we have a really, really lighthearted, lovey chemistry. And um, I remember one of our, one of our like crowning moments of where I just, we both took a moment to reflect was we, when we woke up in Mexico, we both looked at each other and it was like maybe our second day ever seeing each other. And we thought to ourselves, like, I can't believe I met you on a reality TV show where I, you know what I mean? Because if I, yeah drew you or if I thought about you or if I, you know, met you in the street, you would have basically been what I would have wanted to, you know, who I would have wanted to be with. Right. And so, yeah, there are some differences within, uh, you know, our, our dynamic, but there's also a lot of similarities, right? We really do. Uh, we do see a lot of things the same way that brings us in like this really amazing connection. Um, and obviously, I'm very lucky. My wife is hot, right? It's very like it's it's interesting. You both are hot. I'm just gonna say, I think you both were the hottest. Can I say this? Am I allowed? I don't know if I'm gonna <laughs> piss off the rest of the cast because I love them all. But you guys were definitely win the award for like hottest couple by by Thank far. You. Thank by you. Far. I will pass that on, or she'll hear it when she listens to me. <laughs> you said something during after the altar, and I actually stopped. I paused. I re. I, I I had to rewind it. I listened to it again, and I made a note of it in my phone. It struck a chord with me. You said on After the Altar recently, the person for you is the person you can be your most authentic self with. You can be as weird as you want with yeah. them. And and you you even went on to say, love isn't fun if it's not a little weird. I yeah. loved that. And I couldn't agree more. I'm like the queen of weird. Hello. I, I like named my pool swan after you. Would you <laughs> guys consider yourselves, you've been married a little over a year now. Would you guys consider yourselves somewhat of a normal married couple after a year of marriage or is it still a circus? Um, it's, it's still a circus in the best way, right? Like we, we laugh at, like even last night, we, we were just like, I think we were both just on a high of something, just like, you know, a natural high, obviously. We were just sitting there and all of a sudden, like, things just got a little goofier. We just started laughing about nothing, you know? Yeah. And so, and and it's funny because Chelsea then quoted the uh, uh, love isn't fun if it is, isn't a little weird or whatever. There you go. There you go. That really is it. Like, we are- I just see that as a future book title for you, by the way. I think yeah. that, like, you guys should co-author a book. L love isn't fun if it's not a little weird. I really just I love that. You should coin that phrase. <laughs> no, I love it. I, uh, I I agree with it wholeheartedly. It's something that I think, like, is really important. If you can't just, like, let loose and you feel shy or you feel nervous about doing things that you would do when you're by yourself, right? then you might not be with the right person. Yeah, totally. I agree with that. Don't hide behind a mask. You know, for most of the show, your mother, I know, did not seem to want to engage in the whole love is blind social experiment. And I kind of get that as if, you know, I'm not a parent, but I can't imagine like going home to my mom and dad and being like, oh, hey, mom. Hey, dad. I uh, met this person. We're now engaged to be married. And we also never met in person before 
this yeah. uh, this went down. They'd be yeah. like, mm, okay. So I think a lot of us are wondering, you know, what has has that dynamic changed, if at all? Is your mother and your broader family now close with Chelsea and vice versa? How did that play out? Because I mean, she did. She wanted nothing to do with Love Is Blind. Well, the the nothing to do with Love Is Blind made a hundred percent sense, right? Um, <clears throat> coming to a situation where you're being filmed, like your son's going through this like life changing, life altering experience, and you have to like put on this face and then talk to a camera. Like I know that made a hundred percent sense. Also with me getting married, that made a ton of sense because yeah. I think about myself as someone who processes a lot and thinks about things a lot. Right. And my mom knows that about me as well. She knows that I'm very calculated in the things that I do. Um, and so, yeah, it, it didn't make sense to her that all of a sudden I was just like, Hey, I'm going to do this and I feel good about it and I'm going to move forward. Right? right. Without thinking about it. And I know I have my critical overthinking stages and moments. And so my mom was just trying to make sure that I was prepared for what I was getting into. She was being a mom. She was being a mom. <laughs> yeah. You know, and uh, there are a lot of really, really, I think, supportive and open moms in this situation. But I think what she did is being supportive and loving in her own way and just stepping back and saying, hey, I want you to really, really think about what's going on here for your own good. And yes. that makes sense. You know, what I, I mean? respect, I actually respect it a lot. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, I know it's difficult and I prom, I, I know that you were in pain in that moment and it's hard to watch it play out on the big screen, but I get it. She was, she was showing love and support to you in her own way. But I mean, have things come full circle? Like where does her relationship now stand with Chelsea? Yeah. I mean, we've, We've been home a couple of times, right? And so her and Chelsea have spent a little bit more time together. My mom owns a store back in Maryland. Uh, Chelsea spent a little time in there. They've gotten to chat a little bit more, you know what I mean? And so after the experiment, it took a while for my mom to really open up back to me even, Wow. right? Yeah, yeah. because, yeah, I mean, it, it took a while to process that. And so we are at a great place because now my mom and I are on just like the best terms which yeah. means it opens up her heart for Chelsea as well. Right. right? And right. so they're, they're talking more, uh, I think there's more uh, affection and connection in them yeah. as well. And so, yeah, it's it's slow and steady, but that's that's okay. And I'm sure you're like not shy, totally not outgoing sister Barb has had no help in any of this in, in bringing uh, the family together. I know. <laughs> Barbara's been, yeah, she's been a, a big catalyst to try to make sure that things um, work out that way. Because, you know, her and Chelsea are like, they're they're almost best friends. They, wow. um, they, talk, they talk significantly more than me and Barbara talk. Wow. Um, yeah, they're, they're kind of two peas in a pod, which sometimes scares me, but it is yeah, what it is. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Like a little too close for comfort there, yeah. but no, that's, that's, that's really sweet. And that, that is a special bond and you should yeah. cherish it. Now, have you warmed up to the color pink? I'm noticing a lot of neutrals in the background here. I, um, it, like I was, I really was expecting to see like pink frills and like pink pillows <laughs> and pink this and pink that. Like, where do you stand on the color pink, Kwame? Well, I mean, we'll call this my man cave, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I will say I, I love the color pink. Like right over my shoulder, you see my my Jordans right there. I do. They're, yep, they're pink and light blue. Oh, in the okay, yeah, yeah, I see those. Yeah. Okay, yep. And so we'll give I, you a pink I, pass. Yeah, right. Since I think since we've got married, I I've I've always liked the color pink, but now I definitely wear it more often. I have three pairs of pink Nikes. <laughs> a few pink shirts in there. So there's definitely more pink in my life. Yeah. Well, you can't have no choice with that. You have to just, <laughs> just embrace it. You Listen, you're a strong, secure man. You can wear pink. I love, I love guys who wear pink. A, a girl that's, that's a known fact that girls actually love guys that wear pink because it just shows confidence. Your girl, Chelsea threw out the first pitch at the Seattle Mariners game, which was just right. such a cool experience. Now I'm curious how, you also went with Zach and Bliss to go do that. How did she get chosen to throw out the first pitch? Was she like specifically asked or did you guys all flip a coin? Like how did that happen? The coin flip would have been cool. Um, yeah. yeah. I think I think it just made sense for her. She's been a big Seattle sports fan okay. for her entire life. Yeah, I think she's in terms of being a Seattle sports fan, she's the biggest one um, okay. out of the four of us. Um 
you know, she took me to my first Seahawks game. Um, you know, you're a Portland. You were in Portland and you made the move to Seattle. Yes, yes. But I wasn't a Portland sports fan because I grew up on the East Coast. So I had a couple of teams that I was kind of picking through, but I never had loyalty to the city I was in. Okay. And that kind of changes the dynamic because now being in Seattle and going from not loving Seattle at first to absolutely loving the heck out of Seattle. Yeah. Gives me that pass to start supporting the teams a little bit more and obviously being married to someone who does. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I mean, all in all, she got that first pitch because she is a true, like, you know, die hard. Yeah. Die hard Seattle sports fan. Now I really was hoping that while calming Chelsea's nerves before throwing the first pitch, you tell her to just like boss up, just <laughs> bop, boss up, boss up. If you've watched the show, you know who I'm talking about. He, I got him to laugh. Oh, my God. That's so funny. That's, a, that's a one of the funniest. Oh, my goodness. I love that. That is so good. Speaking of Jackie and Marshall, and you you did say that Marshall's one of your best friends, and I love hearing that. I, that, like, is music to my ears. Did you – I have to ask, did you feel bad for the way Marshall was treated by Jackie when all of this unfolded and went down? I know they're fine now and, like – you know, they, the dust has settled, but like while it was happening, were you like, bro, what, like what, what, who, like what <laughs> they were like, her, she's, she's keeping the ring. Like what did you, what, what, where was your stance on this? I have to know. Yeah. So, I mean, whenever your friend is going through heartache, you're going to, you're going to feel some of that pain, you know? And I think I didn't really want to blame it directly on Jackie. I never had the best relationship with Jackie, but that's just because we never really connected. Yeah. Right. So it wasn't really animosity or hate towards Jackie at all. It was more just trying to make sure that Marshall was OK. Um, mm-hmm. And so when it all comes down to it. We definitely went through some tougher conversations and some, you know, some some hangout sessions and some like just like, yeah, some moments of really just like talking things yeah. through, you know, off camera, I'm sure, too. Like, yeah, what off just camera. happened? Yeah. Exactly. And so, yeah, I mean, it helped both of us, right? Um, Because it helped me to understand what was going on in someone else's dynamic as well, especially looking at a scenario where it is very unfamiliar to all of us and having to go through this. Um, So, yeah, I felt I felt bad for what was going on, but I didn't blame Jackie necessarily. I just knew that it was a relationship that wasn't really going to be a positive light in my friend's life. And so that's what we needed to focus on was finding him a way to move on from that relationship. Right. And ultimately it just, it wasn't meant to be. It wasn't meant to be. So, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I will say though, a lot of us at home were wondering like, what was up with Jackie keeping the ring that Marshall gave her? Do you know if she's since given back her engagement ring? Uh, Like, have we ironed this out? Inquiring minds want to know. I mean, did she give back the ring? I'm part of those inquiring minds. Uh, Oh, (laughs) <laughs> okay. I was a little bit more detail about that. Um, yeah. But, but in all honesty, also, like, it's one of those things where I know Marshall said it, like, the engagement ring was like a symbol of his love and she didn't really deserve it. But if you think about, you know, where he's at right now in his life, I don't think he would even want that ring back, right? Because he's moved on. He's in uh, a great relationship with Shay and I love Shay. She's really awesome. Um, so I'm sure that that symbol, it would be a representation of what happened back then. True. Bad energy. Bad energy. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. So the Marshall facial expression challenge, I was the funniest thing I've seen in a minute on after the altar on Netflix. What is that about? Like in hindsight, looking, looking at Marshall, he did have really He's very animated and he had very, very, very funny facial expressions. What is that about? And can we do it now really quickly? (laughs) I almost, I feel like I have to see uh, one of the Marshall videos really quick to do it. But yeah, I mean, (laughs) I know it's, he's very animated. And during the reunion, he was super animated and that just became a thing. Uh, So yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's it's great. He is an animated person. That's one of my favorite parts about him. So I love love, all love for Marshall. I love it. So we can't get a facial expression challenge from you. Just one. Um, Just one. We'll see. see. All right. Come on. Give me your best Marshall. Oh, that was good. (laughs) That was good. I love it. 
<laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't let you leave without doing the Marshall facial expression challenge. I got, it was the, just so funny. Poor yeah. Marshall. We love him. Marshall, you're welcome on the show anytime if you're listening to this. I know you're really good friends with the Kwame here, so that's awesome. And you're friends with the cast. I think I saw that you're close friends with Zach and with Bliss. What is it about that couple that makes your friendship such a special bond? I'm curious. I think being being weird is like one of those things where like it's never gone out of style. Right. You know? Um, because like everyone wants to be accepted in this bubble of what society thinks is cool. Yeah. But if you can see yourself regardless, that is cool. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I love, I love Zach. I love hanging out with Zach. I remember the last time that me and Zach hung out, I specifically went to theaters to watch Oppenheimer so that I could talk to him about it because yeah, Zach and I, like we have the, just like, I remember you posting about that. Yeah. We have the most in-depth movie conversations. We both really, really love movies so we talk about movies, we talk about um, music, we talk about society. He's just one of those guys who knows about everything. Yes, yes. You know? He's I a smarty pants. Everything. He's yep. v- very worldly, very opinionated, and really marches to the beat of his own drum, and I, I admire that about him. Okay, I have to ask, what do you think of Oppenheimer? It was like, um, <laughs> I loved it. Uh, but I feel like people are in two categories. They either hated it or they loved it. There's no in-between. How do yeah. you feel? Oh, I... I I loved it. I thought I gave it a 9.3 out of 10. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, really the one thing, Yeah. The one thing that I didn't absolutely love was that it was really, really difficult to keep along with it if you even turned away for like two seconds. You I know? get that. Yes. And it is a very long movie. So if you're planning on like getting up and going to the bathroom, don't hold it. Don't even think about it. Don't even exactly. think about it. You want to yeah. you want to go get popcorn? Nope, can't do. Exactly. Can't do yeah, that. But apart from that, it was great. I love the dialogue. I love the writing. I love the cinematography. Cinematography was insane. Over just great movie. It's so funny. So at a time, so it was obviously battling Barbie in in the box office, yeah. and at the time, which and, I watched that as well. Amazing. Oh, you don't say having the Queen of Pink as your wife <laughs> went to go see Barbie, um, <laughs> but I actually I didn't see the Barbie movie, and I went to go see Oppenheimer. I took my father, my my hero, three time cancer survivor, love of my life, took oh. him to go see Oppenheimer for a father daughter date. And I couldn't agree more. Gives uh, Cillian Murphy and Robert Downey Jr. all of the Oscars. I thought it was incredible. Um, we wore, we in defiance, we wore like all black, you know, and everyone at the movie theaters, they were in pink for Barbie. And I was just like, we're going to, we're going to see Oppenheimer. It's really good. <laughs> Love that. So I have to ask, what's next for you and Chelsea? Do you have any bit, ne- you know, after the altar came out, we know that you have your big, you know, soccer uh, resurfacing uh, yeah. event tournament coming up uh, in October, but what's next for you guys? Do you have any big plans or any trips coming up? Any career moves? Um, you know, one right now we're taking it a day at a time. I would say we do definitely want to plan what we just had our honeymoon, by the way. <clears throat> so that was our big trip. I saw on your Instagram. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's great to finally be able to take someone out and be like, Hey, I'm married to this person. Um, and not have to hide them away because they're not on TV yet. But, um, we definitely want to plan a big trip sometime early next year. Yeah. Um, we don't know exactly where it's going to be, but we're currently doing our research to really figure it out. Um, I really want to go to Japan. I don't know exactly where Chelsea wants. I think she wants to go to like the Maldives or something like that. And so every or- every girl wants to go to the Maldives. Just FYI, <laughs> that's yeah. if that's not on your bucket list, it, it needs you need it needs to be it's, it's incredible yeah it's definitely on mine but yeah but japan has always been my number one um i'm a i'm a you know once again i'm a big i'm a big nerd uh and i nerd out with with zach on japanese culture we both love anime and things like that and so um yeah a big trip for sure we've maybe like started looking at some houses um and yeah i mean it's just kind of like the natural steps in life right. you know we were lucky to take one big leap on a step that most people could consider really, really, really important. Um, You know, and so we get to kind of take our time in the other aspects of it. So a big trip um, and, and maybe a house, you know, something that we can, you know, settle in and also see as an investment, work on our finances together, just work on growing together. So yeah, that's kind of the next steps. 
I love it. And I'm not going to pull a Vanessa Lachey and I'm not going to start saying, when are you uh -oh. having kids? Cause uh -oh. I know that, no, cause I know that's the obvious trajectory. Yeah. When you get engaged, yeah. it's when's the wedding. And when you get married, yeah. it's when are you having kids? And it's like, Oh my God, can I live? Can I travel? I, I get I it, man. So I'm not even going to touch it. I'm not even going to go there, but yeah, I'm will, just, yeah. I will say to, to touch on that. I think, I do think like as a society, we have to stop putting pressure on other people to go on timelines that we believe in. You know, when, when uh, we post, when Chelsea and I ever post a, a photo together, a vast majority of the comments are, we can't wait for the babies and wow, right. the babies. And I'm like, we can't put that as the required next step because there are circumstances in life where people may not be able to get there. Absolutely. There's so many life factors. Some, you know, infertility being one of them, yeah. maybe one spouse wants kids, one spouse doesn't. I mean, there's so may, or maybe you just don't feel ready. Maybe there's certain goals and dreams you want to accomplish before taking that step. So I admire you and appreciate you saying that because I, I think there's a lot of the silent majority out there feels the same way about the, the baby and the wedding pressure. <laughs> and I don't believe in timelines. That's listen, that's why I started reinvented. You can reinvent yourself at any age. You can start over. You can say, this path is not for me. I'm going to try a different path. I'm going to take a different route. And it's made all the difference in the world. Exactly. And it's just going at the pace that is comfortable for you and your partner. And I do say, ultimately, yes, we both want to have kids and we plan to do that at some point when it's best for us, but we'll get there when we get there. Amen. I love to hear it. Well, Kwame, I'm so happy you made the time to come on Reinvented and share your incredible story. And it, it really is incredible. I wasn't kidding when I said that to me, you represent the American dream. And I'm just so honored to be able to share this time with you and peel back the curtain to the real Kwame and not just the super jacked athlete you see on Netflix. So thank you for coming on, Kwame. Well, thank you so much for having me, Jenna. I'm grateful that you tagged me in the uh, the swan photo. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it all started with a swan. Just think, <laughs> a swan brought us together. Well, guys, a fresh crop of hopeful singles will enter the pods for season five coming up once again, hosted by Nick and Vanessa Lachey. There's new faces, a new city. Same old age old question, is love truly blind? Oh, wait, Kwame, I can't let you leave yet. I had to ask you the million, the, the question, the question uh, of all questions. Uh, yeah. is, love, is love truly blind? Love, you know what? I'm going to say love love is truly blind it really is wow. but i don't think me and my wife ever had to really experience that because i think we lucked out there wow that's beautiful <laughs> i love it you guys are very lucky hold on to each other well anyway tune in guys for season five coming up of love is blind can they make it out of the pods and down the aisle like kwame and chelsea or will they leave the experiment just as single and miserable as they started Tune in. I don't know. Check out the show September 22nd. As for this show, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to Reinvented with Jen Eckhart. That's available wherever you listen to podcasts, Spotify, Apple, YouTube, iHeartRadio, you name it, it's there. I'm Jen Eckhart. That was Kwame Apia. Thank you for listening.